Hi again, everyone, and welcome back to the Global Emotional Health Summit. This summit is all about helping people find tools or find a way that they can go internally and work on what we have our, already ourselves to make those changes rather than always relying on an outside source to make the change. So with this in mind, I'm delighted, really delighted to have our next speaker with us, uh, Philip Shepherd from Ontario in Canada. I was luckily enough to attend a workshop with him when he came to Ireland earlier last year and really delighted, and I know that he's coming in, in, in March again up this year to Ireland, so he can give us details about that should anybody wish to go. But he does travel the world, of course, and we'll get into that later. So really, um, what I love about um, Philip's work, well, there are so many things, it's hard to pick one, but my, me, myself, on my own personal journey, and I do a lot of work with chakras, and I noticed that I've been coming more in tune with my second chakra, the sacral, in the past few months, it being the more feminine creative center the, and finding that the imbalances and what's manifesting for me, let's say, is more in that region. So I love this whole topic that Philip will talk to you about. And I am really going to stop talking and, and let us join the conversation because it's, it's, and this is where I want to jump off into the conversation. Welcome, Philip. Uh, thank you so much, Dolores. It's a pleasure to be here, of course. It is. It's great to have you, but I've said that already. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, Philip, your work, um, it's really like, there. I love it because I'd love you to start off talking to us about this whole um, area of going into the more, the centre that is the more feminine and having that sacred dance, that, that inner marriage of mixing, blending the acknowledging that, yes, of course, we use our brain and that the intelligence of the brain is so important for us, but that bringing it down into the other brain in our body, the creative center, that's where we get our inner dance. So Absolutely. can you speak to us about that, please? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm um, working away on a new book, <clears throat> um, which is being published November 14th. I'm thrilled to bits about it. And one of the things, book looks at is our senses and we have five senses and we, we all know what they are and that's quite arbitrary to our culture there are other cultures who have a completely different set of senses and one of the interesting things about our set of senses is that they're all about the exterior world you know the the light the sound the touch the taste were attuned in a, in a sort of cinematic way to the outside world. And I say cinematic way because you sort of, you know, you can watch and hear the world like a movie around you. And there's a whole region of sensation within the body. Um, neurologists call it interoception as opposed to exteroception, which is, is sensing the world outside. There are cultures who only recognize interoception. Um, so there's a culture in Africa, the Anglo Ive, and everything they experience is felt through the body. So they they hear through the body, they see through the body. There's this life within, and we we don't even have a word for that realm. No, in, sure don't. So it's like in our culture, it's like there's a, a boundary around the self and we sit inside that boundary and notice the world around us. And it's, it's sort of ruinous to any attempt to find harmony in your personal life because you're already in a divided state. So that, that whole inner realm um, is is alive with intelligence and and of particular importance to that intelligence is this center in the pelvic bowl and it's honored by other cultures it's honored by the japanese by the incan by the chinese they you know in in japan when they go down 
to their belly, they are returning to their deepest sense of truth. They're, they're returning to their profoundest understandings. And, you know, you think by contrast, for us, the belly is just this troublesome area that's prone to weight gain and indigestion, I, you know. So, so, <laughs> so we've, we've been darkened within us the sensitivity that allows us to feel the present. Because really that, you know, the, the head is where we can consciously think. It, it, it gains perspective. When you're living in your head, you're living at a distance from the world. And that, I mean, that, that distance is useful because, because perspective has value but then we don't know how to bring that, that perspective down to be integrated, which is what happens in the pelvic bowl. It, it's got a genius for integration. It's the center of felt relationship. And there's a real difference for me between known relationship, oh, I know that that's a tree, and felt relationship where I feel its presence beyond all language or category. So that capacity for felt relationship is the, the center of this intelligence in the pelvic bowl that we've cast into darkness. And as you say, I really feel that center and its capacity for integration and felt relationship and intimacy. I really feel that as the female pole of my consciousness to balance out the male pole of my consciousness. And they're designed to work together, but it's like we've, we've cut ourselves off from the neck down. Absolutely. And, you know, I've heard you say before, too, about, um, you know, even as, as children, um, this is a whole going off the point now, so bring me back in if I am. But, you know, we're not really almost, we're, too, we're called too sensitive as a child. And it's something I even say myself, I have sensitive children, you know, but it, and there can, you know, this is the intelligence of sensitivity and it's okay to feel this, to be sensitive, to allow ourselves as long as we can possibly, you know, ground it. And would you give um, us maybe an explanation of if we feel that we have, or even let's talk about it, you know, if we feel we're, we have oversensitive children or that possibly we're very sensitive ourselves, is it through our breath that you recommend? Now you have your book and I want you to let people know about that too, because I'm sure you've exercised us in that and I know you have. So is it through the breath that we allow ourselves feel the sensitivity that we almost should allow ourselves, but learn how to ground that so that we can deal with what happens to us on a daily basis. Yeah. Let me back up just sure. a bit to give, to give a bit more context. So, so because we are taught to live in a divided state, because we're taught not to be whole. I mean, if you're living in your head, you are relying on a portion of your intelligence and you're not, you can't access the whole of your intelligence. So because we live in this divided state, we, we don't feel the wholeness of the self or the wholeness of the world around us. And then we, we have these grave misunderstandings. We, you know, we, we misunderstand success. So we've defined in our culture to success in such a way that it, it deems wholeness irrelevant. I mean, if, if wholeness takes a hit on your way to success, collateral damage, what does it matter? Um, we, we misunderstand intelligence. So because we're so committed to this faculty of abstract reasoning, we say, well, that's what intelligence is. It's the ability to reason in an abstract fashion. And for me, that's, you know, that's a, part of our intelligence but it's this like narrow bandwidth on a spectrum of our intelligence and that spectrum for me could be called sensitivity and I don't care if if it's a sensitivity to a child's tears to to the smell of a pine tree to birds in flight to color to arithmetic relationship any sensitivity is a form of intelligence. But the nature of sensitivity is that it's reactive, right? Light hits the, the retina 
at the back of your eye and it reacts to the light in a way that the skin on your nose doesn't. It's, so sensitivity by itself cannot make coherent the information that it's gathering. So that the reactivity that, that sensitivity depends on has to be balanced by grounding. So to me, true intelligence is grounded sensitivity. And, and that quality, if you, if you appreciate that your, your native intelligence is one of grounded sensitivity, then you start to see how very clever we are in our culture, but that we've forgotten what it means to live intelligently. We've lost that resource, and there's all the difference between intelligence and cleverness. And then you look also, you, I mean, you mentioned kids. You look at what we do to our kids. The education system is putatively there to, to develop their intelligence, and it systematically desensitizes the kids and leaves them ungrounded leaves them out of touch with their bodies. So what, what grounds us is our presence in the body. When we, you can come to rest in the body, on the earth, at this moment of time, you're grounded. And so you mentioned breath. Breath is a huge um, avenue into self-awareness and being able to bring yourself back to that settled place in the body. Another realm that's hugely important is noticing the energy in the body. We tend to want to manage it. We tend to want to control it and, 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 and um, make it right. And, and, and so we don't ever take that moment to just notice it as it is here and now to feel the body's energy, to feel the little bits of anxiety, to feel the, the, the tension of anticipation, to feel the, the, the muscular tone that's, that's unable to relax, to feel the sparkly bits and the fuzz balls and all that universe of energy within the body. And once you, once you begin to pay attention to that, then you can allow that energy to sort of, melt and settle down in the body and come to rest. And when that happens, you just arrive here. And that groundedness enables your sensitivity to awaken. So, you know, there are, there are so many people who think of themselves as too sensitive. And I don't think there is such a thing, but what it is, is the more, the more, your sensitivity is awake to the world around you, the more necessary it is to be grounded and at rest on the earth in that way. Wow, I always get so, I just, when I listen to you, I automatically feel grounded mm. because I become more present. I was a little up there at the start of the interview because I was racing around not being present with getting ready. Yeah. You know, and so, you know, life, but as you say there, I just took it down what you said there, feeling it. So feeling what I felt coming in, feeling a little bit, maybe not prepared enough because my two children are off sick today and, you know, some of me there. But that's just, I mean, it's, people have different stories and that's my story. You know, for somebody else, it could be something much more serious. But I suppose it's just that coming back to being present moment. And would I be right in saying that? Yeah, and there, you know what, there's, there's, there's all the difference between knowing what is right and feeling what is. So we attach ourselves to these ideas of what is right, how to breathe, um, um, how to run a meeting, how, and, and we eclipse what the body knows. We... So we, we commit ourselves to doing things that we know are right and that feel bad. And the fact that they're feeling bad, the mm -hmm. fact that we turn our back on that, leaves us incapable of coming into harmony, it leaves us incapable of 
returning to our wholeness. And I, you know, I say returning to our wholeness. We are whole. I mean, the, the nature of reality is this inescapable wholeness in which everything affects everything. Everything depends on everything. The, the merest, you know, flap of a butterfly wing affects everything. So wholeness is inescapable, but what happens is we sort of systematically desensitize ourselves to wholeness. And, and we're taught to do that. We're instructed mm. to do that. And so then we, we chafe and feel the anxiety and irritation of a lack of wholeness mm. when it's right there. But we've got so much patterning in the body that we have eliminated our access to it. Wow, that's, uh, you, you, you put it so well, you know, and it, it makes it very well, very easy to understand when you put it like that. Um, it actually almost makes us feel, or made me feel anywhere there that almost allowed to feel the way I did and not to there again berate myself for not being perfect, which I never do anyway because perfection and me are sort of, um, I don't agree with being a perfectionist because I, I don't know who, hits, who sets that bar. So for me, that allowed me, what you said there, allowed me to feel the way I was, but then, uh, then remembering to come back to this lovely centered place and to feel into what, everything that's going on and to just be okay with that. And it just brings your, for me, it brought my sort of, I wasn't very anxious, but it brought me down to a more grounded state where when I felt and allowed myself to have this felt sense, I guess. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So here's an interesting sidebar to that. We, as a, as a Western culture, we have believed since 500 BC that reason is our primary and, and superior faculty, that it's, it's at the pinnacle, that reason will, will be able to solve the problems we face. Reason knows what's going on. Be reasonable. Mm. And there's a researcher, um, he's actually a Canadian, but he's working in, in Britain at the moment, um, John Coates, who, who was a trader on Wall Street and left Wall Street and became a neuroscientist and then came back to Wall Street, very curious about how traders make decisions. How do they assess risk? And because he was a neuroscientist, he looked at two areas. He looked at what was happening in the body. So he, he specifically looked at cortisol responses in the body, which, which are the primary indicator of stress. And he also looked at the psychology. So he would, he would give traders questions to answer at the end of the day about, about their decisions. And what he found was that the body knew exactly what the risk was. The response in the body was exactly in tandem with the actual risk uh, um, of any trade that was being made. The psychology had no relationship to the risk. I mean, sometimes it matched up and, and, and usually it didn't. And, and so he said, well, that's interesting. If the, if the body knows the reality, then in theory, traders who are more in touch with their bodies should do better. Mm -hmm. Then he did another experiment, and he went to the uh, London trading floor. And the big question was, how do you know if a trader is in touch with his, and in, in this case they were all men, his body or not? And so there's a simple test where you randomly, during the course of a day, ask someone what their heart rate is. And they're not allowed to, you know, to, to feel their pulse sure. manually. They, they have to just feel it in their body. Some traders have no idea. They just can't feel it at all. And some are surprisingly sensitive to it. They can tell you reliably what their heart rate is. And then he looked, and then he looked at the previous year at, at the record of trading, and he found that those who could feel their heart rate 
did significantly better than those who couldn't. That's fascinating. Isn't that lovely? So you couldn't have a more abstract, head-centered activity than trading on the stock floor. And here are these guys who are learning to notice what the body is feeling, to notice what's happening in the body, and their trades are more accurate than those who can't. And even, he said, the stock market even selects for sensitivity because traders who survive in the stock market, um, the veterans are, are way ahead in terms of, of being in touch with what their body's feeling in comparison to, to novices who are starting out. That's very interesting, isn't it? Um, and you are, like I, I didn't even introduce, when, when I came in, I didn't actually say that, you know, you're known as the International Authority on Embodiment um, I just think that's, but it's, isn't it a lovely, um, I know that we don't always get very hung up in titles, but, you know, this whole area of embodiment is just, it's so fascinating. And it's, it's, to me, it's like even that story of these people that are trading when they're in touch, how, how different, and I mean, the name of your book, New Self, New World, you know, when we create this new self, it is creating a new world for, for even ourselves personally. And as we know, then that will ripple out. I mean, me becoming more uh, grounded will have a ripple effect on everything else for the rest of the day that's going on in my life. So it is to me that that's what I take from it, like this new self that I can create from listening to what your teachings will create a new world for me and ripple out to those around me. Absolutely. And, that, you know, the, the new self, you know, to be, to be specific about what I mean by that is, is to un, undo the patterns that keep us from being whole, the patterns that prevent us from thinking with the whole of our being. So there's this wound that, that our culture creates whereby it divides our thinking from our being. And we're taught that in school. You know, the energy of your being is a liability. You're punished if it gets out of hand. You have to you have to, you're trained to keep that still and sit in that chair and, and not be a, a bother. And meanwhile, fill your head with this information. And this information is completely out of relationship with the intelligence of the body. So we're taught that you can think more accurately if you dissociate from the body's energy and just just be reasonable. And, you know, the research of John Coates has demonstrated the fallacy of that. But still, people, people, well, at this point, don't know how to get back mm -hmm. to that intelligence of the body. So my work is, is really about helping them recover that sensitivity and not, you know, it's not, it's not, the truth of your being doesn't lie within the envelope of your skin. Wow, <laughs> that's a lovely statement. Yeah, so, so, you know, inner work is so important, but to me it's like the body is a resonator and it will resonate to the world in a way entirely unique to who you are. But, but it's like we... The, we, it's like a bell, but we stuff the bell with cotton balls and it, it cannot resonate to the world around. So all that inner work is just about removing the obstacles, about kind of dropping away those cotton balls. So then the world can ring you. And the truth of your being is what happens when you stand here in the present moment, awake to the world and feel its tug. You feel it whisper to you. You feel it guiding you forward. And that's so the truth of your being is in that relationship. That's wonderful, uh, Philip, the way you say that. And, um, you know, I've heard you say as well that uh, this feeling of I should be in the now can create that tug as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, like, it's funny. We have all these shoulds. So the desire to orient your life is is necessary it's important and and you know you could take you could take um being present to orient your life or you could take being compassionate or peace of heart or joy 
you could take any of these things and say, this, this, is, this is how I want to orient my life. And the, each of them carries an inherent risk because that slippery spot where it turns from, from understanding that you want to live with compassion to being in a situation where you say, oh, I should be compassionate here. And the moment you say, oh, I should be compassionate here, you are in a divided state. There's one part of you that knows what compassion looks like, knows how it behaves, and it's trying to make the other part of you conform to that. If, on the other hand, you orient your life according to wholeness, you avoid that risk because you cannot make yourself whole. A, you already are whole, and B, all you can do is to surrender to it. You cannot make it happen. It's not an artifice. You surrender to your wholeness, and there it is. And for me, the moment I drop into that wholeness, I can be no other than compassionate. I have peace of heart. There is joy. All those ideals and i am present all those ideals that we that we hold up as 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 ways of orienting ourselves just naturally come about in in a place of wholeness so if somebody was in a practice of um because we're often you know we often uh, listen to people telling us that affirmations and you know i've done it myself so what would you say to somebody that has uh, already got a daily schedule of affirmations? Now, this may be, I don't know what, what kind of a question this is to ask you, but, you know, it's, it's a great to have the belief that, you know, I am something possibly, they, you know, we're often told to, to fake it till we make it. You know, what do you say to people that, you know, <laughs> yeah, you know, I feel joyful, even though we don't, we're not in a state of joy. Is that sort of disassociating there, there again from the head? So, you know, we're, it's not what we think we are. So do we sort of try to drop down into the pelvic area before we say these affirmations or how would you answer that? <laughs> you know, I would, I would never advise someone against whatever works for them, including fake it till you make it. But I, I would ask a question. And my question is, is your practice helping you towards wholeness? Okay. That's the only, that's the only question and I think there are I think any practice can do that with the awareness that 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 you are surrendering the practice is facilitating a surrender to wholeness and if it's not facilitating that surrender then it's putting your head in charge and then you you're actually the practice is inhibiting your ability to be whole yeah, th thanks for that. Because you know the way you, we do it like that. It, it's about it's about really telling people in a in a way that they can practice this on a daily basis. You know, not kind of thinking, oh my goodness, I've been doing all this wrong all the time. But it's just that explaining exactly, and that's why I asked that question because I know affirmations are huge for a lot of people, and I love to hear your view on it from that more awareness. So it's about the surrender, and it's about I suppose there again maybe how we feel about what we're saying. Would that be right? Is that what I took from what you said there too? Listening to or listening to our body and our gut instinct as to how it's making us feel when we say this. Yeah, let me, let me reframe that a little. Um, we, are, we are so deeply stuck in a way of being that is, that is not whole, mm -hmm. that even, even those um, laudable sentiments that... that are designed to help us towards wholeness are furthering division very often. So that phrase, listening to the body, um, is wonderful. But ultimately what it's saying is that you're in one room and your body is in another room. And there's a wall separating you from the body. And the best you can do is to put your ear to the wall and notice what's going on on the other side. Okay. So, so listening to the body um, is, is very useful. Like if I'm injured, I just put my attention there in the way I need to. But, but it's not 
embodiment. Okay. So to make that distinction, to know that listening to the body is sitting in your head, paying attention to the body, that's not the same thing as embodiment. Embodiment really is when your awareness drops down through the body and comes to rest in the pelvic bowl. Um, and you, like, like that African tribe, you are alive. What happens is that you're no longer in the present. The present is alive within you. When you're seeing from that place and hearing from that place, you, you are feeling the present within you. So your center of awareness is deep within the body. And when that happens, you're no longer listening to the body. You're listening to the world through the body. And so all, all of this is, a, is just a way of framing affirmations. I don't tell myself what I should do. The affirmations I hear derive from my attunement to the present. And as soon, yeah, as soon as I feel the present, I know. I know with a certainty that, that, that is beyond doubt or question or quibble. I just know what is needed, what to do. That's great. And thank you so much for that, that wonderful explanation, because I think that can, you know, really, really let people know the essence of what you're saying, you know, because I suppose um, it, it, we've listened to so many other ways before. Um, it's lovely to listen to this wonderful way of, of the felt senses. And also just... Um, Something came into my mind there as you were talking about, yeah, I mean, I remember one of the exercises was um, that we, I did at your courses that was letting, letting some, a story almost go from the different parts of our body and feeling how, how, the, how it changed almost what we said from the different centers. And I mean, that's, it's a wonderful way to experience how to do this embodiment, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, and to, to kind of shed light on, on how much intelligence there is in the body, how it illuminates. And, and the whole, that, that exercise you referred to um, is, is, is one that shows us how the body's intelligence can integrate. So we gather perspectives, we sit up in the head at a distance from the world and gain perspectives and perspectives and we, you know, we're taught to have faith that when you gain enough perspectives, it'll add up to a whole. And it just doesn't. It's just not how it works. You don't paste together facts and end up with, with a whole understanding. Wholeness of understanding, that integrated understanding, happens as you literally bring that idea down through the body. And that exercise, you know, you... You let the idea sit in your heart and you notice how that feels. And you let it sit just a little below the belly button and you notice how that feels. And you allow it to drop down to the pelvic floor and you notice how that feels. And it's, it, it's like mapping out experientially um, the realms of intelligence in the body. And so it's, you know, I, I, never, I never suggest to people what they should find. Because I don't know where someone's wholeness is going to take them. But to see that discovery, you know, in, in the course of the workshop that people make and what it feels like to have, you know, some simple idea drop down through the body and integrate is glorious. Absolutely. Yeah. And I often talk about in my work where if your heart isn't in it, you know, sometimes when we're working with the chakras, you'll get stuck maybe at the heart because you might have a great idea in your head and you might have, you know, all the work done. But if you're, if you really get stuck at the heart level, you have, you know, asking the question, is my heart actually in this? Um, so I love that when I remember that exercise very well from your, your workshop, it's so different. The sensation of when we're looking at it from a different perspective, almost, but from the perspective of our own inward, our own body looking at it. And dropping down to the different awareness centers, I loved that, and I, you know, it's 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 um, it really opens us up to a to our own in, intelligence, our own. That's that's the listening I would have got from it. It's it's just it's a wonderful it's a wonderful way of life, really yeah. sitting with something 
and letting it go to these. And would you recommend this for, you know, this summit is talks about emotional health as well. So, you know, going to emotions, let's say, um, if someone was suffering, say, from anxiety, would you consider or this a way for someone to sort of just maybe let the emotion go down from the head to the heart, the different centers, the belly, the pelvic bowl? Or how would you look at um, emotions in, um, in regard to this work that you do? In terms, in terms of wholeness, what keeps us from wholeness is unintegrated energy. Okay. And so, you know, they're like, they're like six, there may be more, but I'm aware of six different kinds of unintegrated energy. So what we've been talking about, the, the energy of an idea, it, it integrates as it's brought down through the body. And we also have unintegrated and, um, muscle patterns. And we have unintegrated emotions. And we have unintegrated warnings, like, like um, don't do that, you look stupid. I mean, like as a kid, Right, we take on these these warnings, and they live within us for decades. And they 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 believe we're still six years old, and they're standing vigilant over us to keep us safe. And until that's integrated, it will it will do its job in the belief that it's that it's helping us. Um, we have unintegrated energy centers, so the. The head isn't integrated with the heart. The heart isn't integrated with the, the intelligence of the pelvic bowl. The, the sexual energy of the genitals isn't integrated with the heart or the head. I mean, it's all, you know, we live in this binary either or um, um, modality. And finally, there's the unintegrated energy of the present. So until, until you can process and integrate and and flow with the energy of the present, you're, you're not yet whole. So, so the unintegrated emotions are, are energy, and we feel them as energy in the body. And if they're not grounded, then they're keeping you from wholeness. So the irony to me is when someone suffering from anxiety tries to talk themselves out of it. And so what they're doing is they're using language in, an, in a realm of abstraction, and that's really what the head specializes in, is abstraction, to undo something real. So you're trying to, to, to undo a real reaction to the world with, with an abstract that, that, that part of you will never believe is true because it's so abstract. Wow. Right? So then, the, you know, another approach is to feel the anxiety in your body and actually feel it and find that relationship between that energy and the pelvic bowl, bring them into relationship and allow that energy to settle down through the body and come to rest there and integrate. And when that happens, that energy will, will sensitize you to the world. It will inform you um, about the world rather than um, dividing you from it. Okay, so you have um, there again, speaking about if people wanted to find you know, more information as to specific exercises, they're in your book, right? Yeah, they're in my book. There's also, um, you know, I've got on my website um, eight exercises as audio recordings. Brilliant. And um, fill, up with the, fill up with one L. Yep. Shepherd, that right? <laughs> yep. uh, fill up with one L and shepherd spelled exactly the way the guy who looks after sheep is, is, is spelled. So philipshepherd.com where people can go and get these um, audios. Yeah, and it, I mean, it's $12, which helps cover the studio costs. Of course, um, yeah. But there are, you know, there are eight of them, and, and they're all about um, coming home. How do you come home to yourself? How do you come home to your, your being, your wholeness, your truth in the world? And it's all through the body. It's all through um, 
that awakening sensitivity to the body and that, that realization that once you, once you give your attention to the body and enter that universe of feeling, you can bring harmony to it. Mm. I love that because it's, it's a very different approach um, to dealing with the emotions. It's the feeling it and letting it there again as the intention of the summit was to let people be aware that we can go inwards. And I think this is, this is, these are wonderful exercises for people to, and there again too, I think, you know, people that deal with anxiety on a higher level, maybe than some, maybe social anxiety, it's great to be able to have access to something that they can do in the privacy of their own home and really hone in on it and listen to these audios, listen to this work that they can actually, and also take at their own pace with no shoulds, no therapist breathing down their neck, which may, which may for some people um, almost feel like a judgment that they're not getting it right for this therapist. So I love the fact that you've got audios that people can actually just tune in themselves in a lovely, you know, easy way, I would see it as. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm, you know, all of my work is about, about helping individuals come into their own truth, come into their own power. Um, and, and I never know what that truth is. I don't presume to know what that power is, but I see it happen as they, as they come more and more deeply in touch with, with their being or their place of wholeness. Um, they just, they light up kind of like that Christmas tree behind me. (laughs) And it's, you know, it's such a glorious thing. It's such a wonderful, it's it's why I keep teaching and teaching and teaching because of what happens in that workshop. Yes, and we are recording this in December, of course, for um, a January, um, uh, going out live in January. So hence this Christmas tree in the background. So when I was saying that you'll be in your, can you tell us a little bit about your, your schedule for 2017, in case anybody um, from anywhere in the world that could be watching would like to know where they could possibly join a workshop, which I would highly recommend. Yeah, and it is, um, it is um, really around the world, uh, you know, from Australia to Europe and North America. Um, if, if people go to my website, the whole of the schedule is there. Um, I'm in Belfast in late February, the 25th and 26th. And I'm in County Clare, March uh, 4th and 5th for a weekend workshop. But I'm also doing a... Uh, an intermediate workshop that I'm very much looking forward to um, on the Monday, Tuesday following. So that's, I'm, uh, I'm really, I, I love, I love the weekend workshop. Um, it's, it's like, it's like this polished um, stone almost, but then to follow it with the intermediate workshop when I'm able to do that, um, it, it, it's like all the support gathers around the work and supports it and it's um i just i've had such wonderful response from people who've who've done who've done both it's uh yeah the, yeah the intermediate workshop is a range of exercises that that i don't none of them um are from the weekend workshop they're all new um uh, different you know the more ways in which we can experience being or experience the patterns that keep us from it the freer we become so you don't have there's no prerequisite for uh the the intermediate one you can or do you need to have done the first workshop with you to attend yes okay. yeah if you if you've done a weekend workshop at some point um then then you're welcome to the intermediate great and, we, and you're also teaching people to, to do this work which is absolutely phenomenal all together and you must feel very proud of that fact that you can actually not alone is it just yourself <laughs> but now that you will have teachers or maybe you have already yeah it's just it's it's in a way it's the most gratifying work i do because it's over the period of a year with a group of people who who bond and question together and, and explore the work together and uh it's it's i'm at the point where i can't i can't fulfill all the requests that are coming in. So to have other people there qualified to teach the, the workshop is absolutely wonderful. And I've, there are three groups that, that have been through it. And, and 
at some point in the near future, I'm going to be setting up a group either in Ireland or France, um, in Europe somewhere. Um, I'm Great. excited. Yeah, it's three five-day periods over the course of a year. And, and it's not, you know, it's not just for people who want to teach the work. I, if someone is practicing modality and recognizes that this work um, will, uh, will complement that modality, they're welcome. And there's some people who do the teacher's training um, just for their own personal development. And you know what you said about, about the ripples? going into the world, you know, if you do that work, you're carrying, you're carrying the work into the world in a different way. So I welcome it all. Yeah. And I do find that, that like I, I, I have had to learn patience because I, I used to say I wasn't born with patience, but when you become a mother or a father, you know, a, a parent, um, I definitely have had to learn ways that it ripples out because, you know, we can get triggered by situations into whatever, into anger, into fear, into whatever. And rather than smothering our children with our own fears or lashing out in anger, I think it's definitely been a journey for me, this integration. And I love when I can actually look back at a day, doesn't happen all the time, where I've let this ripple go out and that it's actually been positive. Absolutely. I apologize for the noise in the background. My dog is thirsty and is... That's quite okay. I almost had an intrusion by my seven-year-old or my 12-year-old as well. So apologies for that in case anyone here is crashing down in my perfect office that I don't have. <laughs> exactly. Life is just like that, isn't it? Yeah. And I think that's lovely because we started with that. I know I had so many questions with, yeah, like that. It's like just being with it and being present with it. And so Philip, before, you, uh, before we end, is there anything else that you'd like to uh, cover? You know, I mean... Anything that you feel that people would, could really benefit from hearing from you, giving you the last word almost, <laughs> without me putting in more questions? Sure. Um, you know, what we, what we lack in our lives because of our cultural training is, is that capacity for felt relationship, the capacity to just feel the present, to just feel each other without, without um, reacting uh, as, as we've been patterned to do. And the quality of felt relationship is gentleness. But when you, when you pick up a teacup gently, when you move a baby's arm gently, when you hold a rose gently, um, you are coming into felt relationship. And, so if there, I guess if there was one thing I'd leave people with, I'd, I'd say, you know, maybe explore how you can bring gentleness to your relationship with yourself first, to be gentle with your feelings, to be gentle with your judgments and, and doubts and, and concerns, to be gentle with your loves. And then, and, then, and then let that move into the world and how to be gentle with each other, how to be gentle with our concerns, how to be gentle eventually with the present itself, to allow yourself to feel the present as gently as you can. Mm. That, that, that path of gentleness is one that carries us into wholeness. And I'm sure, like I can remember, maybe I think that I could use the, um, the, the exercise from the workshop of letting this, you know, wh whilst our environment, all hell might be breaking loose, it's for us to get into this, um, into this lovely grounded state, but feeling everything, feeling what's coming up for us and allowing it just to go down the different centers. Would I be right by saying that? Absolutely. Absolutely. You, you, can't, you can't begin to ground what you're feeling until you allow yourself to feel it. <laughs> it's kind of, you know. But that's perfect, actually, because that's, um, that's, a, great, that's a great way of, of explaining it, too, because, you know, for someone, I suppose, that we're all on different, you know, we've, some of us know what grounding is, and some people don't, and that's okay, too. So rather than just Googling grounded, how to be grounded, 
it's, I like that you said that so that it's, it's, we have to actually experience it first. We can't just grab onto grounding and say, I should be doing this. I should be grounding every day. It's the allowing it. So thank you for saying that because as I say, you know, it's not everyone that, that knows grounding, um, but it's, it's certainly a way for us to know that it's not just something we can grab onto. No, and I, I think my, you know, the easiest way I'd have of, of describing what it is to be grounded is, is just it's that state when your body's energy is at rest. When that happens, you're grounded. And so it begins, you know, it begins by recognizing your body's energy without any judgment, just recognizing where it is and then giving it permission to kind of drop down through the body and come to rest. That's wonderful. That's probably the nicest, uh, nicest definition I've ever heard of being grounded. Mm. Yes, you know, it's great. So um, all I can say is um, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your wisdom with us. Um, it's been absolutely wonderful. Um, and definitely, um, I might even, that, that interesting workshop sounds good. So I hope that people do go onto your website um, and have a look even at what you you know where you are in the world. I know you've Australia. You've mentioned. I know you are in Europe and Ireland and America, and your book is there. You, people can buy your book online, I presume. Yeah, I mean it, it's distributed by Random House, so it's pretty widely available. Great. Uh, the other thing uh, about my, my website I might mention is there there are a lot of there's lots of, of free stuff. Um, there are interviews and and uh, videos and different things that people might enjoy. That's great, yeah. And then it, that, that's nice because I, I like it's it's nice to offer that so people can get a feel there again and then go yes, you know, and go off. And so anyway, thank you again, Philip. Um, I think that you've been a great addition to the summit because it's great to hear. It's just great to hear this. Uh, uh, the way you the way you phrase everything is just so wonderful. And I think you've made certainly me very grounded in this. Uh, <laughs> in this <interview. laughs> And it's great that I'll hopefully go on and, um, and let that ripple out for the rest of the day. <laughs> yeah, and blessings on your kids. I hope they recover. Anyway. Thank you very much, Philip. And thanks very much again for being part of the summit. And we'll speak again soon. See you in Ireland. So look forward to it. Okay, thanks, Philip. Bye-bye.